Hello and welcome to Fireside Fairy Tales. My name is Rory and uh, you're watching Varietal Literature's YouTube page, which is a place on the internet just for narrative. And what we do here on Tuesday night is we read old narratives. <clears throat> um, some quite old and some a little more recent and renditions of them and collectively we could call that folklore, folk tales, or fairy tales, occasionally mythology. Um, I just realized I have a little off strand of hair. If I was watching this, it would annoy me. Let me. Here we go. There. Now, if you're not watching this live, you can skip such interesting moments as that by going down to the description below and clicking on uh, timestamps, which will take you to the beginning of the story <clears throat> that we're going to read or the little preamble that we're going to read before the story. Um,. Yeah, anyways, you can skip over whatever you want and get to the section you want. But if you are here live, you're obviously stuck with me. So what you can do is go and join the live chat, which is already populated by a wonderful little uh, crop of potatoes that uh, pop up on Tuesdays. <clears throat> and among them, I can see Tammy Morelli is here. Hello, Tammy. I hope your injury is feeling better. GS is here. It's good to see you, GS. Thanks for watching. Zombie Wolf is here. I hope you're cooking up a good fact for us at the end uh jump store says glad i'm still early <laughs> uh don't worry we wouldn't think to start without you well okay that's i i have to start without you if you didn't show up for the whole stream um <laughs> uncle kitty says hi all hello uncle kitty i hope the storms are nice to you or at least have settled down and uh genera's here good to see you genera i'm glad that you found the time tonight uh we're always happy to have you and... Anyways, I think that's all. The rest is everybody else catching up with each other, which is a thing that you can do as well if you feel so inclined. Um, by joining in on the live chat, you do have to have a YouTube account. It is free. You don't have to, like, have a pay one. Um, <clears throat> but, um, anyways... Some adjustments here. Let me tell you a little bit about what we're reading today because it's of a slightly different <clears throat> um, nature than our normal stories. Uh, although I don't know that this this really has a normal because sometimes we read long form uh, interpretations done in sort of folkloric styles with reference to folklore characters, but is largely uh, original creations by authors. Uh, sometimes though we do straight from like archives very brief collections of uh folklore that were collected from what would be called at the time peasantry um but today we're doing something uh that we've kind of done before which is we're going to read a folklore tale but it's been and it, it is real folklore and it is collected by a person and being relayed to us but it's being relayed to us in a frame now, we've talked about this idea of, like, a frame for folklore before when we were talking about and reading a couple of S. Bjornsons uh, of S. Bjornsson and Moe, <coughs> who, if you don't know, are, like, the Grimm brothers of Norwegian folklore, uh, his Holder tales, uh, where basically it's, in his case, he frames it as, like, tales being told to him in a little short story about where it's basically just how he collected them, which, you know, the people he met and talked to become characters in those stories. Now, that's not the frame that what we're going to read today has. It's not about how this person collected those tales, but they do have a frame. And this book is largely uh, more oriented towards younger readers than the stuff I normally read. But I did enjoy the frame. I enjoyed the writing style of the author. And so I'm going to take a moment <coughs> and um, tell you a little bit about those two things. Let me just pull my tea bag here. By the way, if you're drinking tea, what kind of tea are you drinking? And if you're not drinking tea, get on it. I'm just drinking Earl Grey. From a cup, by the way, that was gifted to me. Please don't drop on the computer and ruin it. Uh, that when it heats up, reveals a little kitty in design. And here. And here. 
I don't think you can get them anymore, but they used to be at a place called David's Tea. Okay. <clears throat> um, this is from an author called Parak Colum, and uh, he is obviously Irish. He lived, uh, he was born in Ireland, lived a little bit in the late 19th century, traveled with his family to the gold rush in America, but then, as I understand it, spent most of the rest of his life in Ireland. Um, <clears throat> he was uh, among the circles of people like Yeats, uh, who have, we've read some of his collections of folklore before. Uh, Parrick is um, <clears throat> um, a poet, which will come to bear in this, a original storyteller. Uh, so he wrote his own, I think he was a stage right as well. Uh, but in this case, what we're going to see is a collection of folklore tales being told by a boy <laughs> who heard them from birds. Now, rather than sit here and dryly explain how all that worked, I'm going to read you the first chapter of this book, which is short, uh, just to explain the framing device, because it comes up repeatedly in how the folklore is relayed. Um... And I think it's, it's, um, the, um, oh, for a minute there, I thought you'd be serious, Zombie Wolf. Zombie Wolf says, ah, oh, Rory, that's so mean to show something cute that I can't find. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you can try. There aren't even really David's Tees in the mall anymore. And, um, I think there is still an online store, but I don't think that mug is available anymore. <clears throat> um... Anyways, uh, the book is called The Boy Who Knew What the Birds Said, and it's from 1917, I believe. Uh, and uh, it has some great illustrations, which I used at the, t the front here. I realize I'm going to give you the full illustration here and sort of break immersion with my stream. But you can see the full picture there. And that is actually from the story we're going to read. So... Okay. <clears throat> so, the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to read to you not a piece of folklore, but the framing device for um, this entire book. Because we will pro probably pull other stories from it in the future. And I just wanted to have one place where people could come and reference and figure out why the stories, the folklore, is framed the way it is. <clears throat> So, um, all our stories tonight, therefore, are coming from the same book, from the same author, Power at Column. Um, but they are, this first one will not have anything to do with folklore. It's just explaining the frame for the book. Maybe it has its roots in folklore. I, I don't specifically know a story of a boy who can speak to birds, but it wouldn't be remotely surprising because such things occur all over folklore. Um... <clears throat> And then we're going to read uh, The Stone of Victory, uh, which is a little epic fairy tale about a boy and a stone of victory. <laughs> Unsurprisingly. So, our first tale tonight comes from The Boy Who Knew What the Birds Say, or said, rather, um, and, which is a book by Parik Kalam, uh, spelled P A D R A I C. Uh, and um, we're reading the first chapter here, which is called How He Came to Know What the Birds Said, which is not a piece of folklore, but it is an important way piece of framing for the folklore that we're going to read later as to why it's written how it's written. There is one thing that all the birds are afraid of. And that is the thing that will follow when the bird that follows the cuckoo flies into the cuckoo's mouth. And what will happen then, asks my kind foster child. When the bird that follows the cuckoo flies into the cuckoo's mouth, the world will come to an end. All the birds know that, but not all the people know that. Well, one day, the cuckoo was sitting on a bush, and her mouth was open, 
and the bird that follows and the cuckoo flew straight at it. And into it he must have all flown only for the boy. The boy was in the tree and he flung his cap at the cuckoo and he covered the cuckoo and the cuckoo's open mouth. Now the bird that follows the cuckoo flew into the crow's mouth instead. And the crow gave that bird a squeeze, I can tell you. And the cuckoo pushed off the boy's cap with her wings and flew into the forest. And all the birds of the king's garden were there at the time there were. The crow, the woodpecker, the wren, and the eagle, the blackbird and swallow, the jackdaw and starling, and the wonderful peacock, the lapwing and peewit, the bold yellow hammer, the bad willy wagtail, and the raven so awful, and the cock with his hens. Stone checker, hedge sparrow, and lint white and lark, and tom tit and linnet, and brisk little sparrow, the kingfisher too, and my own little goldfinch. All the birds in the king's garden were overjoyed that the bird that follows the cuckoo did not get into the cuckoo's mouth. What shall we do for the boy who prevented the world from coming to an end? asked the good nature corncrake. She was there too, but I forgot to mention her. Nothing, said the willy wagtail. The boy who would throw a cup would throw a stone, do nothing at all for him. I'll sing for him, said the goldfinch. I'll teach him what the birds say, said the crow. And if he knew the language of the birds, he would be like King Solomon, said the raven. Let's make him like King Solomon, said the goldfinch. Yes, 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 said all the birds in the king's garden. And the boy had not gone far when the crow flew after him and lighted on his shoulder. The crow spoke to him in the boy's own language. The boy was surprised. The crow flew to a standing stone and went on speaking plain words to him. Oh, said the boy, I didn't know you could speak. Why shouldn't I speak? Know how to speak, said the crow. Haven't I, for a hundred years and more, been watching men and listening to their words? Why shouldn't I be able to speak? And you can speak well, ma'am said the boy, not forgetting his manners. You know one language, but I know many, said the crow, and for I know what people say, and I know what all the birds say. And the old crow sat there looking so wise and so friendly that the boy began to talk to her at his ease. And after a while, the boy said, Ma'am, do you think I could ever learn what the birds say? You could if you had me to teach you, said the crow. And will you teach me, ma'am, said the boy. I will, said the crow. And then every day after, the crow would sit upon the standing stone, and the boy would stand beside it. And when the crow had eaten the boiled potato that the boy always brought, she would tell him about the languages of the different birds. The two were teaching and learning from that day to day, and indeed you might say that the boy went to school to the crow. He learnt the language of this bird and that bird, and as he learnt their languages, many's and many's the good story he heard them tell to each other. And there is probably one of my favorite pictures in the book. <clears throat> the, um... I think the thing that delighted me the most, that's the end of the first chapter, um, I think the thing that delights me the most about um, uh, the um, story here is that it, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, it frames bird songs as storytelling. So when you wander around as a child or something, if you had heard this you would start to wonder what stories are the birds telling. What do you think, folks? Do you think the birds tell stories? And don't give me any of that while well, we know that they're mating calls nonsense. Forget that. Okay. More lovely art. So, this is our story du jour. And let me 
equip us a little bit of ambience. G.S. says, yes, some tell elaborate stories. G.S., what bird do you think tells the most, the longest stories? Because I think the chickadee just tells little, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, oh, it slipped my mind. Short, very short little tales. They're Greek in form. I, I forget the name for some reason. <clears throat> our first actual tale today is the second chapter of the book who knew what the Bo bird said the boy who knew what the bird said by power column and uh the first tale that he's going to overhear the birds telling each other is the tale of the stone of victory a tale about the king of ireland If we went there, maybe we'd find it, said the cock grouse to the hen grouse as they went together clucking through the heather. And if we found it, if we found it, what good would the stone of victory do us, said the hen grouse to the cock grouse, and answering him back. And what good did the stone of victory do to the youth who was called Feet in the Ashes, and who was only the swineherd's son, said the cock grouse to the hen grouse. Tell me, tell me, and then I shall know, said the hen grouse to the cock grouse, answering him back. And they went together, cluck, 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 cluck walking through the heather, and the boy who knew what the birds said followed them. He lay upon a rock, and the cock grouse and the hen grouse discoursed below him, and the cock grouse always lifting its voice above the hens. The boy heard what they said, and he remembered every word of it. And by the tongue and the mouth, here is the story he heard. Clucky, 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 coo, coo, coo. The king of Ireland stood outside the gate of his castle, and his powerful captains and his strong armored guards were all around him. And one of the captains went to the mound before him, and he gave a shout to the east, and a shout to the west, and a shout to the north and a shout to the south. And when the king asked him why he did it, the captain said, I want four quarters for the, of the world to know that the king of Ireland stands here with his powerful captains and his strong armed guards, and that no one dare come from east or west or north or south, lay the weight of a finger upon him. And when he said this, the other captains flashed their swords, and the guards clashed their shields, and the King of Ireland said, Well, faithfully I am guarded indeed, and luckier am I than any other king on the earth, for no one can come from the east or the west or the north or the south and lay the weight of a finger upon me. But no sooner did he say that than they saw a giant coming across the hill and towards the place they were standing. And when the giant came to them, he lifted up his hand and he doubled it into a fist and he struck the king of Ireland full in the mouth. And he knocked out, not one, not two, but three of his teeth. He picked the king's teeth up and he put them in a pouch and without one word walked past them the guard and all and went on down to the sea <gasps> Whew. 
Who will avenge the insult put upon me? Said the King of Ireland. And with them, my captains, will go and win back for me my three best teeth I had. But not one of his captains made a step after the giant. I know now, said the king, how well you serve and how well you guard me. Well, if none of you will help me, if none of you will avenge me, then I'll find those who will. And now I will make a proclamation, and I'll solemnly disguise that whoever avenges the insult offered to me, and in addition brings back to me my three that were the best teeth in my head. Even though he be a servant or the son of a servant, I will give him my daughter in marriage and quarter of my kingdom. And more than that, said he, I will make him the captain over all my guard. While the proclamation was sent all over the castle, and in the end, <clears throat> it came to the ears of the swineherd's son, who was called Feet in the Ashes. Funny name, I think. <clears throat> and when he heard it, he rubbed the ashes out of his hair, and he said to his grandmother, If there's anything in the world I want, it is the king's daughter in marriage, and a quarter of the kingdom. I'll want provision for my journey. I'll do better than that for you, honey. If you're going to win back the king's teeth and marry the king's daughter, said his grandmother, I have a few things of my own that no one knows anything about, and I'll give them to you with your cake. Here, said she, is my crutch. Follow the giant's track till you come to the sea. Throw the crutch into the sea and it will become a boat. Step into the boat and in it you can sail over the green islands that the giant rules. And here's this pot of balsam. No matter how deeply or deadly <clears throat> the sword cut or the spear thrust wound is, if you rub this balsam over it, it will be cured. Here's your cake too. Leave good luck behind you and take good luck with you and be off now on your journey. <clears throat> and why was the youth called Feet in Ashes? said the hen grouse to the cock grouse. Well, he was called Feet in the Ashes because he had sat in the chimney corner from the time he could stand upon two legs. And everybody who called him Feet in the Ashes thought he was too lazy to do anything else. Well, he left good luck behind him and took good luck with him and started off on his journey with the cake, the crutch, and the cure. He followed the giant's track until they came down to the sea. Into the sea, he flushed flung his grandmother's crutch and it became a boat with masts and sails and he jumped into the boat and the things that had to be done in a boat were done by him he hoisted the sails the red sail the black sail and the speckled sail he gave her prow to the sea and her stern to the land the blue sea was flashing the green sea was lashing but on they went with a breeze that he himself would have chosen and the little creatures of the sea sat up on their tails to watch his going and so he went on until he came near the green island where Shamble Shanks, the giant, who had carried off the three teeth of the king of Ireland, had his castle and his stronghold. He fastened his boat where a boat should be fastened, and he went through the island until he came to the high grey castle. No one was about, and he went through it, gate, court, and hall. He found a chamber. <clears throat> where a fire burned on the hearthstone. He went to the fire gladly. And he looked around the chamber, and he saw three beds. <clears throat> There's room... There's room to rest myself here at all events, said Feet in the Ashes. No.
night came on, and he left the fire and got into bed, and he pulled one of the soft skins over him, and just as he was going to turn on his side to sleep, three youths came into the chamber. And when they saw him, they began to moan and groan. And when they looked over them over, he saw that they were covered with wounds, with spear thrusts and sword cuts. The sight of him in the bed more than their wounds made them moan and groan. And when he asked them why this was so, the first of the three youths said, We came here, the three of us, to fight the giant Shambleshanks and to take from this island the stone of victory. We came to this castle yesterday, and we made three beds in this chamber so that after the combat we might rest ourselves and be healed so that we might be able to fight the giant again tomorrow and the day after. For we know that we cannot win victory over him until many combats. But now we come back from our first fight and find you on one of our beds we've made. We're not able to put you out of it. One of us must stay out of bed, and the one that stays out will die tonight. And then it will only be two against the giant, and he will kill us when we come to combat again. And when the first one had said all this, the three youths began to moan and groan again. Feet in the ashes got out of bed. Oh, you can have your rest, the three of you, he said. And as for me, I can sit by the fire with my feet in the ashes, as I often am. Uh, as often as I did before. The three ewes then got into the three beds, and when they were in them, feet and ashes took the pot of balsam that his grandmother had given and rubbed some of it on each one of them. And in a while, their pain and their weariness left them, and their wounds closed up. Then the three youths sat up in their bed, and they told feet and ashes their story. Clucky, 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 cluck, 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 said the hen grouse. And what was the story they told? Cluck, cluck, said the cock grouse. Wait until you hear, cluck, cluck, said the first of these youths. On this island there is a moor, and on the moor there is a stone. And that stone is not known for mother stones, but it is the stone of victory. The giant Shambleshanks has not been able to find it himself, but he fights with all who come here to find it. Today we went to the moor. As soon as we got there, the giant came out of the grey castle and fought with us. We fought and we fought, but we wounded us so sorely that we were like to die of our wounds. We came back to rest here. Thanks to your balsam, we are cured of our wounds. We'll go to fight the giant tomorrow. And with a surprise, he'll get us seeing us before him so soon, we may be able to overcome him. And along, and along with the surprise, there's another thing that will help you, said Feet in the Ashes. And that is myself. I have to fight the same giant Shambleshanks, and I may as well fight him in the company as alone. In company as alone. Your help will be welcome if you have not come here to win the Stone of Victory. Not for the Stone of Victory have I come, but to win back the three teeth that were knocked out of the King of Ireland's head, and to avenge the insult that was offered to him. Then we'll be glad of your help, good comrade. The three youths got out of their bed and they sat with the feet in ashes around the fire. And the four spent a third of the night in pleasant storytelling and slumber nor weariness to come near them at all. Clock, 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 said the hen grouse. Say no more, said the cock grouse, for now I'm coming to what's wonderful in my story. While well, the four youths were seated around the fire when a little man came into the chamber. He carried a harp in his hands, and he bowed low to each of four of them. I am Macrow, the giant's harper, he said, and I've come to play music for you. Mm. Not one tune do we want to hear from you, said Feet in the Ashes. Whether you want it or not, one you will hear, said the harper, and that tune is the slumber tune. I shall play it for you now.
And if the whole world was before me when I play it, and if every one of it had the pains of deep wounds, the playing on my harp would make each and every one of you, them fall into a slumber. A tune we must not hear, said the first of the three youths, for if we fall into a slumber, the giant will see to it that we shall never awaken. But, McDry, the giant's harper put his harp to his chest, and he began to play. Slumber came on. Oh, the eyelids of the four who were at the fire. Three sprang up, but one stayed on his bench. Dead sound. Fast asleep. One yawned and fell down on the floor. And one of the two that remained went towards the harper, but on his way, he fell across a bed. And he remained on it. Then out of the floor, only one, feet in ashes, was left awake. And the harper played on. I'm pausing just for a moment here. I want to know what chat's guess is as to how he's going to stay awake. Because you're probably wrong, but it's worth guessing. <clears throat> feet in ashes put his fingers in his mouth and commenced to gnaw on them he gnawed at the first two fingers down to their joint but still he kept open his mouth kept open in a yawn and still the slumber kept high on his eye heavy on his eyelids oh, so he gnawed his third and his little finger <laughs> Then he put his whole right hand in his mouth and he bit at his thumb and he bit so sharply that his senses nearly all came back to him. And with a kick, he knocked the harp out of the harper's hands. He caught McTroy, then and turned him head below heels and left him hanging by his feet from a beam across the chamber. Then he went straight through the hall and out of the castle. Well... A wet breeze was blowing. And whatever sleep was on his eyes, it blew it away. He walked on the on with the dark clouds of the night going behind him and the bright light of the day growing before him. <clears throat> I'll turn back, said he. When I hear a cock crowing, or whatever I find beside me, I'll take with me to remind myself of where I've been. And he found himself on a moor, as the boys had described. And he walked on, until he was far on it. And a cock crew. <coughs> Time to turn back, said Feet in the Ashes. And he looked round to see what he might bring with him, and he saw on the ground a round stone. A round stone, said the hen grouse. Yes, said the cock grouse. A round black stone. And he took it up, that round black stone, and he went back to the castle, hungry for his breakfast. Well, in the castle chamber, the three youths were still slumbering. <clears throat> one on the bench, one on the floor, and one in a bed. And McDorari the harper was still hanging by his feet from the beam across the chamber. Let me down from this good lad, said the giant's harper. I will, said the feet in ashes, when my three companions awaken. They won't awaken, said McDorari the harper. Then you can hang there said Feet in the Ashes. They won't awaken, said McDroy, until I cause them to awaken, and I shall cause them to awaken if you lift me down from this. Hmm. Are you promise by your head, said Feet in the Ashes. By my head, I promise, said Giant's Harper. Then Feet in the Ashes lifted the Harper down from the rafters, set him upon his legs. McRory took up in, 
the harp and he pulled the strings back ways and the notes he drew out were so piercing that the first one and then another and then a third of the youths wakened up then when they were on their feet the giant's harper slipped out of the house and went away and what happened to the harper after that no one knows cluck cluck said the hen grouse and what did they do after that the next thing they had to do the cock grouse drawing himself up was to fight Yes, my lady, to fight? The hen grouse drooped her head and said no more, and the cock grouse went on valiantly. Swords they drew out, the three ewes who were with feet in the ashes. Just need a drink of tea, sorry. They sharpened these swords and they marched off towards the moor with the swords in their hands. Feet in the ashes had no swords. All he had was one, a holly stick. In other words, a stick from a holly bush. When they came in sight of the grey castle, they saw the giant. <clears throat> and he came rushing out of the gate. He was all clad in iron and had a sword in one hand and a spear in the other. And the four you spread them out so that they might be able to close round the giant. But for all his bigness, the giant was quick enough. And he struck one of them with the, beer, <coughs> uh, with the spear. and brought him down onto his knees. He struck one of them, <clears throat> the other with his sword, and brought him down on his side. And he struck the other with his iron-covered hand and brought him down onto his back. And all that was left now was feet in the ashes with his holly stick. What could a youth with a holly stick in his hand do against a giant that had a spear and a sword in his hands and was besides all covered with iron? Well, he did the only smart thing. Feet in ashes, turned and ran. He ran towards the castle and he went around it. And when he was at the east side of the cat, the giant was at the north. And when he was at the south, the giant was at the east, and round and round the castle they went, and the giant with his strength and his quickness was wearing out feet in the ashes. <clears throat> feet in the ashes wanted something to fling, <clears throat> so he took the stone out of his pocket, the round black stone, and he held it in his hands, and he made three circles in the air with it, and he flung the stone, and it struck the giant. <clears throat> Pardon me. And it struck the giant on the breast, and the iron rang out as the stone struck it. And down fell the giant. Feet in the ashes ran off to where his companions lay, lay, and many times he looked back, but he did not see the giant following him. The three youths were lying in their wounds and in their pain. Feet in the ashes took out his pot of balsam. It struck rubbed them all over and their wounds were healed the first one stood up and then the second one stood up and then the third one indeed stood up and the three were all whole and well where's the giant each one of them asked lying where he fell and who threw him down said the first of the youths i threw him down with a cast of a stone said feet in the ashes the boys looked at each other, then said, Let us go and see, said the second of the youths. And they went towards the west side of the grey castle like men following a bear who might turn on them. And the giant was lying still. He is dead, said one. He is dead indeed, said another. He is dead forever. And a third, he is dead by the cast of my stones, said feet in the ashes. And they went up to where the giant was and looked all over him. There's the stone that overthrew him, said one of the youths. That round back stone, where'd you get it? On the moor, said Feet in the Ashes. On the moor, the others looking at him. 
Yes, said Feet in the Ashes. Picked it up this morning on the moor, just as a cock crew. And one of the youth, three youths took the round black stone in his hand. I'll uh, bring the stone with me, said he. We'll go into the castle now and see what our finding there will be. They went into the castle. The three youths told Feet and Ashes that they would help him to find what he had come to seek. The three teeth out of the head of the King of Ireland. <clears throat> They searched and they searched all over the castle. At last, one of them opened an iron press, and there on a shelf was a silver cup, and in the cup were three teeth. Feet in the ashes knew they were that <clears throat> what he had come for, and he left the cup beside him. They took provisions from the giant's store and put them on the table, and they began to eat. But the first one, and then another, and then the third of the three ewes made an excuse and left the table. Feet in the ashes went on with his breakfast, and he left the castle to look for the three ewes that had been his companions. And he did not find them. But when he went down to the sea, <clears throat> sure, he saw his boat and the sails were raised on it. And in the boat were the three ewes, and they were making ready to put out to sea. Feet in the ashes shouted to them. Then one of the youths came back to the side of the deck and spoke back to him. You found the stone of victory without even knowing it, said he. And you let us take it in our own hands. Now we cannot give it back to you for our lives depend on our keeping it. And bringing it away. And, said he, we fear to stay on the land with you because you have such luck that you could take the stone from us. The boat we came in is gone. We take your boat. We think that you have such luck that you will find another way of getting off the island. Remember, what you came for was not the stone of victory, but the king's teeth. We helped to find them for you. <clears throat> They'd hoisted the sails, and now a wind came for the boat. And the boat that was from his grandmother's crutch was blown out of the harbor, and Feet in the Ashes was left without any companion on the island. said the hen gross. He found the stone of victory, but what good were his findings to him when he didn't even know what he had found? And he let it be taken from him. But if he hadn't found it, he could have been slain by the giant and take the cup. <coughs> Couldn't have slain the giant and taken the cup of the iron cupboard. And that was so much good the stone victory did for him. Stone of victory did for him, said the cock gross. I'm sorry to think that's all he got from the stone of victory, said the hen gross. Well, that's all he got from it. And be quiet now till I tell you the rest of the story, said the cock gross. And so he went to the courtyard of the grey castle. And he found there a great eagle <clears throat> who was chained. to a great rock and the eagle came towards him as far as the chain would let him feed me said the eagle will you carry me to Ireland's ground if I feed you said feet in the ashes if you feed me every time I open my mouth I will said the eagle that I'll try to do good eagle said feet in the ashes and he went through the courtyard and penfold but not a sheep nor a pig nor a bullock could he find it seemed as if he would not be able to find meat for the eagle, after all. He went down to the seashore, and he came upon a pool filled with thin, bony fish called skates. And he took a basket of these, and he put it on his back, and he came back to the courtyard, and he unlocked the chain that held the eagle. Feed me, said the eagle, and he opened his mouth. Ah. Close your eyes and I'll fill your mouth, said Feet in the Ashes. And the eagle closed his eyes and Feet in the Ashes flung a score of skates into his mouth. Hard meat. Hard meat, said the eagle, but he gulped them down. <coughs> he 
feet in the ashes, holding the cup in his hand and carrying the basket of skates on his back, put himself between the wings of the eagle. And the eagle flew up over the gray castle and faced for the plain of the sea. And they traveled from the morning light until full noon tide, at which point the eagle opened his mouth again. Feet in that ashes had not put nothing into it. The eagle, finding nothing in his mouth, dropped him down to the sea. Close your eyes, said Feet in the Ashes, and I'll fill your mouth. And the eagle closed his eyes, and Feet in the Ashes put another score of skates into his mouth. And the eagle gulped them all down. Whenever I open my mouth, you'll have to feed me, he said. And Feet in the Ashes did not like to hear this, for a score more of skates were all that was left. The eagle rose up again, and on and on he flew until the night was coming over the water. He opened his mouth again, and feet in the ashes put five more skates. And the eagle kept his mouth open and said, Feed me! There was nothing to be done then but to put in the rest of the skates, so feet in the ashes flung them all in. And the eagle rose up and flew, and they traveled while there was darkness on the water. And when the sun rose again, feet in the ashes saw they were flying over the land of Ireland. <clears throat> the eagle opened his mouth. Feet in the ashes had nothing to put in it. Fly on, good evil eagle, said he. Leave me down at the king's castle. Feed me, said the eagle. I will give you what you've never had before, a whole bollock. When we come to the king's castle, cows far off have long horns, said the eagle, mocking him. And with that, he flung feet in the ashes off his back. Sore would his fall have been if it hadn't been on any other place but a very soft bog. And on the softest of bogs he felt, fell. He made a hole in the ground but no bone in his body was broken and he still held the cup in his hands. He rose up covered with mud of the bog and he started off for the king's castle. Cluck, cluck, said the hen grouse. And did not uh, go to see his grandmother at all? If he did, said the cock grouse, that very day, as I would have have you know, the king was standing. If he did, it's not in the story, sorry. That very day. As I would have you know, the king was standing outside the gate of his castle with his powerful captains and his strong-armed guards around him. A year it is today, said the king, since the giant came and struck me in the mouth, knocking me out and taking away my three of my teeth. And since that day, I have neither health nor prosperity. And you know, said he, that my daughter had a quarter of my kingdom is to go to the one who will avenge the insult and bring back my three teeth. <clears throat> such and such a thing prevented me from going, said one of his captains, but now that so-and-so is done, I can go and avenge the insult offered to you. And so-and-so kept me from going, said another of the captains, but now that such and such thing is done, I can go tomorrow and bring you back those three teeth. I'm tired of hearing you all talk, said the king. It's my belief that my teeth will be lost and my daughter will be unwedded till the day of doom. <clears throat> it was then that feet in the ashes appeared before them. Good health to you, king, said he. Good health to you, good man, said the king. And what, may I ask, have you come here for? He was covered with the feathers of the eagle and the mud of the bog. And as you may be sure, the king and the captains and the guards looked sourly at him. I've come first of all, king, said he, to give you advice. And what is your, your advice, said the king? My advice is that you send away all the, these that you have around you, your captains and your guards, and that you turn them into dogs, boys, or horse boys, or anything else in which they might give useful service. For as they are here, they can neither serve nor guard you. Oh, that may be true, said the king, but what right have you to say it? Feet in the ashes had nothing, but he held the cup up to the king, and the king saw his three teeth in it, and he took them out and placed them into his mouth, and the teeth went into their places, and they firmly, they stayed there. <clears throat> then Feet in the ashes told how he had gone to the green island, 
and how he had avenged the insult offered to the king and how he had got what he had gone to search for. And then he demanded the king's daughter in marriage and a quarter of the kingdom and both were made over to him on the spot. As for the powerful captains and the strong armed guards, some of them were made horse boys and some were made dog boys and Feet and Ashes was made captain of the new guards. And when he came to rule over a quarter of the kingdom, he was given a horse and made a duke and he was called by a better name than Feet and the Ashes. But what that name was, oh, I don't remember now. Cluck, 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 said the hen gross. And did he go to visit the grandmother at all? If he did, said the cock grouse, that's another story. And if it was ever told, I don't remember it. Pray go to the right, my lady, for I'm hungry for the sweet buds of the heather. And there he is riding his eagle over the water. Bit of a pen drawing. And that is the stone of victory. <clears throat> Finn McCool also saw the benefits of sucking one's finger, specifically the thumb. Janera said foot torture and then close hand torture. I did actually see that while I was reading. Uh, I was like, oh, Janera's pretty close. They got the spirit of it. Oh, yeah. GS says he needs to quit giving him a score at a time, but when he stopped doing that, the eagle noticed and got quite upset, didn't it? I don't think he can get away with it. Uncle Kitty says the art is pretty sweet in this book. Yeah, I agree. The art is pretty sweet in this book. Um, <clears throat> uh, again, the book is called The Boy Who Knew What the Bird Said. I'll probably read more stories from it because I do like its more animated style. I usually do stuff that's a little more grounded. Um, but... Um, uh, you can get it from uh, Internet Archive, which is, frankly, one of the greatest services <laughs> to humanity going uh, right now. Uh, you should definitely check out Internet Archive. It is a, a wildly underrated service. It, I mean, we use it for looking at old web pages, old versions of web pages, but it also has massive stores of scanned books from libraries around the world and so on. And as I understand, they, they are getting besieged by some copyright threats, which they can... I can go to hell. Um, <clears throat> anyways, you can get this book there um, as a PDF. Obviously, it's just scanned in. Um, I think uh, this copy you can see in the beginning is comes from a New York library. But uh, it's good. <clears throat> uh, it's good, especially, I think, if you have younger kids. Like, I wouldn't, you know, as much as I enjoy Sunken Castle's Eva Poodle stuff from, like, Jürgen Hubert or the Asbjornsen and Moe stuff... I wouldn't necessarily say that's the stuff for kids. Not just because it has some some questionable content here and there. And I think overall kids could probably handle it, especially in this day and age. Um, the, uh, the thing that actually I think is a lot of kids would be bored by it because it isn't very to the point. It's a lot of kind of meandering moments. And this, this recognizes that. It's very clearly written by a poet. It has all these little repetitions and rhythms in it. Um, that you don't normally see, but kids pick up on. They like that kind of melody. Tammy says, well, good night, everyone. It was great as usual. Thank you, Rory, for the wonderful story. Sweet dreams, all. Also, Zombie Wolf got trivia. <clears throat> I assume that's a question, because I don't see any trivia from Zombie Wolf yet. Um, there it is. Random trivia. Well, eagles have tried to carry away human babies and toddlers before, they aren't strong enough to be successful they do sometimes carry off cats and other rodents of course yeah <clears throat> um anyhow uh thank you so much uncle kitty uh zombie wolf for your fun fact gs tammy morelli genera <clears throat> with the successful guests and uh witchery i think i saw earlier but maybe i was seeing things um, if not, nonetheless, uh, thank you everybody and anybody who's lurking and watching. Thank you very much for watching. It's definitely getting into the warmer season here because I am starting to sweat. <laughs> um, so we'll see. We'll get, look forward 
to what I call the shiny streams, where I get shiny. It's like a Pokemon. In the summer, you unlock the shiny. Except instead of being a different color, I'm just actually shiny. Anyhow, um, that's a Celtic fairy tale for you about the boy. Uh, well, it's not about the boy who can speak in words. Uh, it's about um, the stone of victory and feet in the ashes. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. And as you know, I'll keep the fire going, even though it's getting kind of warm. And uh, you have a good sleep. Thank you.